We have several more NHL signings, including some UFA and RFA signings. Plus, we have news in the coaching world, a change in the Ottawa organization again. And could there be suspensions coming from the 2018 World Junior Hockey Team? Hockey Canada's investigation is complete, and the results may be available very soon. We'll discuss all the latest coming up next. So, welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL signings today. We have uh, some key and important RFA signings and some UFA signings here as well. Uh, so let's dive in and get started. A couple of signings in Boston. Nothing too substantial, but they did sign defenseman Ian Mitchell, who they had acquired in trade with the Blackhawks earlier this offseason. Uh, Ian Mitchell gets a one-year contract, 775000 He was uh, scheduled for arbitration. You might wonder why he would settle for a one-year league minimum. Um, if he was scheduled to go through arbitration. His qualifying offer was actually 813750 but that was scheduled to be a two-way deal. Um, obviously, a two-way deal would pay him a much lower salary when he's in the minor leagues, and which is where he's likely going to start. And I would say spend uh, uh, all or most of the season down there would be my sus suspicion uh, based on where he slots in their depth charts. This gives him a one-year one-way deal, so he gets paid more money this way. Um, so sometimes you get these small signings on arbitration eligible players, and sometimes they, they don't sound like they make sense. But if you think about what they would earn depending on where they're slotted in which league, sometimes uh, they can fight for a little bit, you know, better uh, terms to make sure they can maximize their income a little bit. Uh, same goes for Bruins uh, forward Mark McLaughlin. He also gets a one-year contract. This one's a two-way deal, paying him seven hundred and seventy-five thousand at the NHL level. Uh, Senators goaltender. Prospect Kevin Mandeliz, who uh, appeared in a few games last year because of the goalie injuries they sustained, and actually had a couple of really good showings and won a couple of very important games in their quest to try to become a playoff team. Unfortunately, they fell a little bit short, but still he was helpful in the run trying to get there. His qualified offer, for example, was supposed to be 840000 uh, on a two-way deal, which would also pay him 70000 at the uh, American Hockey League level. Now, his new contract, he gets a one-year deal, 775 at the NHL level and 110 at the American Hockey League level. So clearly, uh, the, again, the, here was his qualifying offer was 840. He takes 775. So he sacrifices some NHL pay, which he may not even see, uh, depends on injuries, right? Because Mandalese is going to be like your, probably your number four or number five on the depth chart. You're looking at, now that they have Corpus Allo, uh, him and Forsberg are going to be one, two. Mad Sogard, clearly the number three. Um, he's certainly, out of, out of all the younger prospect goalies, right at the top. And uh, Libby Merlinen, who came over from Finland, I think he would probably slot ahead of Mandelizzi as well. So, uh, you know, he's, he's probably not going to see the NHL unless there's a lot of injuries again. So we might as well go with this kind of contract, which gets him a much bigger minor league salary, 110, which is a huge difference from 70. It's 40000 a year. So when you're making... That kind of money, that's a that's a huge raise and huge substantial difference. So that's why you see some of these things negotiated the way they are. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes today announced they've signed UFA for Brendan Lemieux. He gets a one-year, one-way contract at 800000 So So uh, adds a little bit more uh, grit to their lineup, I guess. Hopefully uh, Rod Brindamore can keep him in check. He does tend to kind of cross the line and do some dumb things at times. So hopefully he'll be a good fit. I know the Canes have good culture there and good coaching. So uh, if anybody can kind of, you know, bring in a, a, a player like that and make sure that they're not crossing the line and doing well, then and I think Carolina's one of those teams for sure. Um, still not quite certain on the the Tony D'Angelo trade that's supposed to bring him back. Of course, those guys would have been teammates briefly in Philly last year. Um, that technically could have went through in the last couple of days and it still has it, so I'm not 100% sure. I haven't heard any significant updates to, to suggest that it's not happening or that it is, so I don't, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Um, the Philadelphia Flyers, this one came in late yesterday after I'd already recorded the uh, video with all the signings yesterday, but the, uh, the Flyers have signed young RFA defenseman Cam York. Uh, he gets a two-year extension at $1.6 million, so that's a pretty um, pretty good bridge deal for them. York should take some big steps this year and get a chance with the trades they've made to play a much bigger role, uh, log a lot of big minutes, and see where his development goes. It gives them a chance to kind of grow into it. It's a good raise, and... Um, at the same time, just the, the team and him both a chance to evaluate things here uh, after another year to see if they want to start talking extension or let things play out. 
Uh, the Montreal Canadiens have also come to terms with their RFA that they acquired from the Colorado Avalanche, Alex Newlook. He gets a four-year deal at $2.9 million. I've seen a various degrees of uh, opinions out there on this. Some think it's a uh, two-inch term. I've seen some say it's two-inch money. But if you look at uh, comparables for him, to me, a, a really good comparable is the guy who's going to sit right in the same room with him, and that's Kirby Dock. Um, similar age, not much difference in age. Now, if you look at the fact that Doc was plucked out of Chicago, and just like New Hook was plucked out of the Avalanche, um, same sort of scenario coming out of their ELCs, and they were not, uh, they were not, they were, they were players who had a chance to play, but they were not anywhere near their peak. You could tell that they were still had more development, and they still had a high, some higher gears to hit. Uh, New Hook, for example. Uh, had appeared in 159 games as of the end of last season, put up 66 points. Uh, at the time when Montreal acquired Kirby Dock, so take away last season, look at his time in Chicago, he had played 152 games with 59 points. They gave him a four-year deal, same term as Nivok, at $3.3 million. Nivok gets two point nine, so it's was $400,000 difference. Obviously, they... Uh, you know, they technically are both centers, but Nivok does play some on the wing. I'm not sure where they plan to slot him, but maybe where he doesn't play center necessarily full time and he may not in Montreal, then maybe they were able to get a little less that way because Doc, Doc, although he hasn't been 100% of center either, he's played on the wing as well. Um, but because centers typically do get paid a little bit more money, uh, maybe they just see Doc's, uh, you know, potential playing higher in the lineup a little bit more. Hard to say. He was a slightly higher draft pick too. Uh, that might play a role. But anyway, these are very comparable contracts. Uh, young players coming out of other organizations that were not uh, hitting their full potential and uh, moved to the young age, and Montreal has given them the same deal. So we'll see, and hopefully things work out. Staying with Montreal, I guess in a sense here, uh, former Ham, Denis Gurionov, has left the Canadians and signed with Nashville. Um, they didn't qualify him and let him become a UFA, uh, which was not shocking because they didn't want to pay him his qualifying offer. They were interested in re-signing him, though, and the problem is that they have a bit of a log jam in the forward position in Montreal that need to move a couple of forwards out. Uh, and I, 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 my understanding from listening to Montreal media is that they had some conversations with him, but couldn't pull the trigger on signing him until they were able to move some bodies out. That is yet to happen. Sometimes when that happens, players get antsy and impatient and another offer comes along that they like and they end up taking it, in order, which is, you can't blame them. Uh, so Nashville signs Gurion up to a one-year deal, 850000 It's a one-way contract. So that's a you know a decent deal for him on a, a one year deal to go prove himself again. So we'll see how things make up there. They certainly are kind of restructuring things. So not surprising that's a good landing spot for him. The American Hockey League Henderson Silver Knights, the AHL affiliate of Vegas, has signed former Oiler prospect Tyler Benson. I'm surprised this guy couldn't even get an NHL two way deal. So he is going to be on an AHL only contract next season after uh, you know years of failing to get a much of an opportunity with the Edmonton Oilers. He's now in their system. Which, which, to be honest, uh, Vegas is a pretty deep team and just won the Stanley Cup, so he would have a really, really tough time uh, getting on that roster anyhow, but at least if you have a two-way contract, you're eligible for recall. Uh, if you're having a good season and they need to call you up, then they can. Now, doesn't mean that they can't do that later uh, if Vegas has the, the space uh, on their... Because you can only carry 50 contracts, and of course, between that and your cap situation... If, if things permit and he's playing well and they want, they can sign him to a, an NHL deal and upgrade that contract to a two-way deal later in the season if things are looking like they want to call him up. Um, but we will see on that. I believe he would need waivers though in that scenario. Uh, the New York Rangers also announced a pretty significant RFA signing, and that's one of their top defensemen here, K. Andre Miller. He gets a two-year bridge deal. Uh, the average annual value for K. Andre Miller is 3.872. Uh, so that's... Uh, I think that's very fair. I think mean, Miller's a great uh, piece there in the back end for the Rangers. Uh, so they get him signed. Uh, obviously, bridge deals were, we knew were likely coming for him and Lafreniere, uh, who was the, now the only remaining unsigned player within the Rangers' uh, prospect role on the RFA category. Uh, that leaves them uh, with, according to Cap Friendly, approximately $2.3 million in space. Uh, and that may or may not be quite enough to sign Lafreniere. Now, of course, that does also leave them with a 22-man roster, uh, which includes, I believe, uh, I think the way Caffrey has their roster structure, they have like eight defensemen on there, so they could certainly demote one uh, and create a little bit more room uh, if they have another player that's 
uh, that's not uh, eligible, or not requiring waivers, for example. They could just put in the minors. I'd have to look at the roster to see, but I imagine they probably do. They could create a little extra space and get like extra eight nine hundred thousand and get that bumped up over three million. Which I don't think it's going to take a full three million to sign Lafreniere. Personally, I'm going to say he's going to get a similar term to Miller, and probably two and a half, two seven five, something in those ranges. Probably where things are going to settle. But we'll see. It, it definitely should be under three million, so they should be good there. And of course, they don't want to be too tight to the cap. Make sure they're uh, accumulating enough space so they can have some decent deadline room later on in the year. Now, on to some other notes from around the NHL. We have uh, news out of Anaheim. Uh, they had an assistant coaching spot to be filled, and they've hired uh, Brett Thompson. Of course, Brett Thompson, uh, former NHL player himself, uh, former defenseman, um, has assistant coach in the NHL before, a couple of years with the Islanders. He's been in the Islanders organization for an extended period of time. A uh, total of 20 years of coaching experience altogether, uh, but he's been the head coach in their top uh, affiliate in Bridgeport in American Hockey League for, I believe it's about nine years. And prior to that, he did have a couple of years on the Islanders bench at the highest level uh, as an assistant coach. So uh, certainly a long time coach there. To be honest, looking back on things, I'm a little surprised he was there as long as they have because the Islanders have not exactly produced a, a ton of players that have gone through their AHL system to develop into NHL players. Uh, during his tenure there, I think, especially in the forward group, I mean, he's more of a defensive coach. Uh, being a former NHL defenseman, I would imagine that the Ducks are probably, uh, they haven't announced what his responsibilities are going to be, but I would I would suspect he's probably going to be looking after the D. Uh, in case you're not familiar with Brett Thompson as well, he's got a, a few kids in the NHL, or mostly one superstar player, Tage Thompson, of course, his brother Tice, also um, a pro hockey player. As well. Either way, regardless of his record in Bridgeport and uh, and what anybody thinks of that, it's a good ten opportunity for the Islanders to get uh, you know a fresh new coach there to work with their prospects that they do have. They don't have a deep prospect pool, but the ones they do have, they want to make sure have a good chance to turn into NHL players. It allows him to move on after a long stretch in the organization and get him back to the NHL. So all in all, I think it's good for everybody in that sense. Uh, the Ottawa Senators and their organizational changes continue. Of course, ownership change is not completely closed yet. Uh, likely it won't be for another at least four to six weeks. It could be a little bit longer, but most uh, NHL, uh, you know, people with the uh, inside knowledge suspect we could be into September before the deal is officially closed. And you could say Michael Anlauer has the keys of the business here, but you could tell his uh, influence and uh, everything is still kind of on board here. You know, he's been in Ottawa a lot lately, took in development camp, has been having a lot of meetings with a lot of the existing employees. And we saw, their, uh, the president of business ops, Anthony LeBlanc, resigned over the weekend, which we talked about yesterday. And now their assistant general manager, Trent Mann, is no longer with the organization. Now, the Sens have not put out a statement here. This comes from reporter Bruce Kiriak of the Ottawa Sun and TSN. So we don't know the exact reasons. I don't know if he resigned or if this is a case of, um, of them letting him go. It sounds like he was let go, but we don't know... Um, the whole story here. Now, of course, at this point, we know his brother Troy, who was previously the American Hockey League coach. We talked about this during the past season. I think it was around February, I believe it was, when Troy was suddenly let go and caught everybody by surprise as the head coach of the AHL team. And there were some uh, uh, insinuations that he was sharing um, scouting information with other clubs or something. And anyways, it just it, it sounded really bad. And of course, I don't know if anything was ever proven true. I know a lot of people said, well, if this was not uh, the case, you would suspect that he'll be getting a lawyer and that this won't be the end of it. We haven't really heard any more about it. So I don't know if Troy Mann's ever sought legal action. Um, you would think that if he did, we would have heard something by now. Doesn't mean that he won't or, or couldn't still in the future. I'm not sure. Um, but it, it is believed that there was definitely some tension within uh, between Trent Mann and the other guys like Pierre Doran, et cetera. You would imagine, right? Because that's his brother. And... and um, it's just a weird scenario. And there was a uh, one rumor going around I seen on social media that, that Trent Mann wasn't allowed in the Canadian Tire Center since that happened. Um, I don't think that's completely true uh, because we've seen Trent Mann and he was at development camp. Uh, he was in the send dressing room with Pierre Doria and giving jerseys out to some of our prospects and taking pictures. Um, obviously a lot of the guys that they drafted, not everybody was at the draft. So for those players who weren't there, they were, we're doing their traditional uh, little ceremony in the room to present them with their jersey and get their picture taken and stuff. And uh, he was there for that. 
Um, and he's been always, he was at the draft with them. Now there were some others that said, well, maybe he, he wasn't allowed in his office. I just, it just seems really bizarre. Uh, I mean, I don't know what's going on in Ottawa. I know this is likely more than anything to do with the fact that ownership's changing and changes are coming. And we know that there's going to be eventually a lot of the people that are going to get cleaned out. It just seems very bizarre. And I'm sure there's going to be more to the story uh, here soon. And Frank Sarah is reporting that hockey, the Hockey Canada investigation uh, on the 2018 World Junior uh, Canadian team, uh, that investigation that the NHL was uh, was waiting for the final reports, everything apparently is getting really close to being wrapped up and that we could be hearing something very soon. I know Gary Bettman and his last uh, address to the media, I believe he said he that it should be wrapped up and uh, results made public I, I think they were hoping for mid to late july so i don't think we're too far away from getting these results uh, to me i think it sounds like teams are probably kind of pushing for answers and frank server rally said that teams are bracing themselves for potential suspensions so i know the last reports that i had seen after i think uh, i believe it was when when police had kind of recompleted their investigation it sounded like they did feel like there was some just cause there that there could, you know, there was, I'm not sure how many of them, but there was some players that were going to be uh, kind of found guilty here, so to speak. I mean, we don't know if uh, legal charges will come from this or how that's all going to play out, but the NHL can kind of decide on its own investigation what they feel is justified regardless of what legal league, uh, you know, impacts these players um, besides that. But I, I don't know. Who or what is going to happen? Uh, just that uh, we're getting close to getting a, a final, uh, you know, closed result on this, and teams are bracing themselves for some suspension. So that says that there's probably something bad coming down the pipe. Just a matter of who and what and the full details. So that's something that we should expect anytime, and I think probably the next few weeks. So let me know your thoughts on all in today's news down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.